play Let's Make a Deal. I'll give you $25 for it. No. Some of you, see, the, the people who are laughing remember that show. Those of you who don't, don't. don't. Good morning, and I first want to thank uh, Grace Fellowship and particularly Bill for inviting me to be here with you uh, this weekend. It's a privilege for me. Um, everybody wants to know who John McMurray is because they all know who Baxter Kruger and Paul Young are. And I'm just that other guy. Um, so, no, no, it's not a woe is me. It's not a woe is me. But uh, I live in Portland, Oregon, about 20, 30 minutes from Paul. And I am by trade, I am a professional nature photographer. I've been doing that for almost 30 years. I travel around the world taking pictures of beautiful places and I get paid for it. So I'm not giving up that job. It's pretty much the best job in the world. So uh, I actually was in ministry. That's what I studied for. Um, and I went, this sucks. I think I'll do something else. <laughs> so. It wasn't quite that bad, but it was close. Um, I am married. I have three children. Um, big year for us. My oldest graduated from Whitworth University in Spokane, Washington. And my youngest graduated from high school. And she's off in uh, less than two months to a university about two hours away from where we live named Linfield. My middle daughter goes to school in Nashville. She will be a junior. So we officially become empty nesters in about eight weeks. And uh, that's uh, going to be an adjustment for us. And uh, actually, it's going to be a hard one uh, for both of us. I think more so for my wife, but for both of us. Uh, those of you that have gone through that phase ahead of me, you, you know what I'm talking about. You pour your life into your children. Um, and for a long time, your life centers around them, their schedules, their needs, what they need to learn, what they want. And now that stops, except for the money part. Yeah. <laughs> so. So we're broke, but that's okay too. That's not another woe is me, it's just a fact. Um, with, fortunately my son is out of college. We, we spaced it out well enough that we only have two in at a time. But, this, Kester, start saving now, dude. Just, I'm telling you, because even if you start saving now, it won't be enough. It won't, so just prepare you. But you're welcome. So uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about my journey, just briefly, and I'll talk more about this tomorrow. But uh, I grew up uh, with a rather strict father. My dad was what I call old school, and he really kind of had a, a view of, of parenting um, and family where he was the head of the house. Uh, he used the Bible as his proof text. And so I hated the Bible. And I hated God because God was the big stick in my dad's hand to make us do what he wanted us to do. And I found out as I got older, much older, that my dad, it wasn't really about some kind of way that he viewed life, it was really more about his control. That's what he wanted. That was what mattered to my dad. He wanted control. And so he did whatever he thought he needed to do to have it and keep it. And that meant having three kids that did everything he said. So I remember one time, uh, this will date me, but it was, uh, it was when the length of your hair was an issue. And it's not anymore, except for Baxter and Bill. They have this thing going on or something. But this was, this was back in early 70s. And you remember 
the Woodstock and Vietnam and all of that for those of you who are that age. Those of you who weren't born yet, bear with me. But uh, the length of your hair was an issue. It was an issue to my dad. And I remember coming downstairs one morning, I think it was a, it was a weekend because my dad was there. And normally he was at work and I was going to school, but I came down the stairs. He was sitting in his chair. He had his chair, okay? And he was reading the paper. And he kind of kind of did this, <laughs> right? And then from behind the paper, I hear, get a haircut. <laughs> and I have no idea why. I, I don't. As I recall this today, I can't tell you why. But for some reason, I decided that I was going to die on this hill. So I said, no, why? It's my hair. <laughs> what? <laughs> so he proceeded from behind the paper to tell me that if I didn't get a haircut, you can leave. So I went upstairs and started packing a bag. But mind you, this is this is no longer over hair. This is now over, I'm 17, I want independence. You can't tell me anymore what to do. And my mom is crying because I get the bag packed and I'm at the door. I'm literally, I remember this clearly, I'm at the front door and I am as mad as I think I've ever been. Um, I, I would never have hit my dad, but I sure wanted to. I'm at the front door with a pack bag. I have no idea where I'm going. My mom's crying, saying to my dad, you can't let him go. He doesn't know what he's doing. Looking at me, you can't go. You don't know where you're going. Um, it'll grow back. Just cut your hair. <laughs> I don't know. Do you, maybe this, again, Crosby, Stills, Nash, they wrote a song, Almost Cut My Hair. That was the name of the song. So it was, like, it was like this issue, because it was a symbol. It was a symbol of independence uh, for our generation. Well, I lost that battle, <laughs> and I cut my hair. I stayed at the house. It would have been kind of hard to explain later in life why I was homeless um, if I hadn't. But anyway, my dad was, was a guy who wanted control, and that affected me in a negative way, profoundly, because it made me push God away. Um, because he, he used God as his big stick, his, his enforcement, his trump card. And I didn't have anything personally against God. In fact, I actually liked Jesus. I, had been, I remember my mom telling me about Jesus. I remember going to Sunday school uh, every week going to vacation Bible school every summer. Um, but I just didn't want to have anything to do with it. And there's irony in all of this because uh, as a senior, I'm looking at places to go to college and I'm trying to find a place that's the furthest away from where I live. I grew up in, outside of Philadelphia. And I'm looking for schools in Oregon. Never been there. I know nothing about it. All I know is it's on the opposite end of the country. I live in Oregon now, folks. Like, again, the irony is not lost on me. Um, so in my senior year of high school, I went to a, a Christian camp. And at that camp, um, a lot of things happened, and something changed in my heart. And I decided I was going to follow Jesus. Now, at the time, when I was told that, I thought what that meant was that you would go into ministry as a career. And so I uh, decided to go to Bible college, and um, that, was, that was interesting. Because my friends would ask me, why are you going to Bible college? And in Philadelphia, where everybody, including the dogs and cats, are sarcastic, <laughs> the response is, to be a Bible. That's why I'm going to Bible college, to be a Bible. You know, like stupid question, stupid answer. 
that's the way Philadelphians talk. And, uh, but I didn't know. I just, I, I would say, because I think God wants me to know. That, that was the truth. And they looked at that, they'd roll their eyes, and I forgot to tell you, my friends were all Jewish. So, I go to Bible college and, and uh, four years graduate, end up working uh, as a youth pastor in a small church for four years. Pastor kicks me out and says, you need to get more education because you're dumb. He didn't say I was dumb. He said it politely. And uh, so I moved to Oregon. I got there eventually to go to grad school to a seminary and uh, got more religious education in Portland for three years and um, graduated. And then I went and taught at a Bible college for a while. And all through that time, I have this passion, which is, I don't know if, if you're like me, it's, it's not entirely bad. There's good to it, but it's mixed. It's good and bad. Um, maybe it started out more good than bad at the beginning, but then it kind of evolved and became more of a mess. And uh, anyway, the passion was to be right. Paul referred to it last night. And so it, it became so twisted and warped that for me, ministry, whatever that is, that word, um, but Christian service, whatever that is, it was about being right. Because eternal life was about believing the right things, having the right system in place, and believing the right ideas. And so being right was everything because your eternal destiny depended on it. And I remember we, we even had uh, these little pamphlets that we would hand out. We were anti-Campus Crusade and the Four Spiritual Laws and all that stuff because that wasn't radical enough. That wasn't clear enough. So we had this pamphlet, and it was a little quiz. Again, because for us, it's about information. You take the quiz to figure out what you need to do to go to heaven. Heaven is utopia. You don't change. You just get everything you want. Right? That's heaven. In most evangelicals' minds, I'm not trying to bash evangelicals, heaven for us is utopia. But it's utopia without personal change. Oh, we're going to clean up our act a little bit, but it's utopia where I get everything that I want without any cost or change to me. So what do you have to do to go there? We'd have a quiz, you know, keep the Ten Commandments, blah, blah, blah. And then, surprise, surprise, the answer is none of those things will get you to heaven. Jesus died for you, and blah, blah, blah. And this is the message that we would go around and tell people and and uh, the reason I say this is because for me, the whole concept of salvation and eternal life, going to heaven, was so weird. But it, I didn't think it was weird because everybody else believed it. It was groupthink. In, in the pond that I was swimming in, the little tadpole, the, you know, tad, not tadpole, but the tadpole, sorry, mixed two words there. I was, I was the tadpole in the tide pool so I, you know I think I'm right and this is important because being right is what will assure me of the prize of eternal life and so I've gone through Bible college I've gone through seminary I'm in ministry I'm teaching in a Bible college and I am building a construct to reinforce my rightness. Are you with me? And I'm actually pretty good at it. Problem was, is that after several decades, it didn't work. It wasn't sustainable. 
I had great answers to the Bible. Like if people would ask me questions about different texts or passages, I had figured out like, well, here's the options. Here's what I think the best option is because my goal was to try and come up with a, a an interpretation of the Bible that had continuity, that made sense, that for me was right. Because again, at the end of the day, I got to pass the test. I got to I got to believe the right things. Um, but my journey wasn't like all of a sudden 180 degree about face from that. There were small things that happened along the way. I remember being in seminary and writing a paper on John 17 and coming to the realization that eternal life wasn't about what you knew, but who you knew. And that registered to me in a significant way, but not enough to change my theology. So it's like, I have this picture in my mind where the Spirit is behind me, and she's got her shoulder in my back, and she's pushing as hard as she can to get me to kind of step across the threshold into the light. And I'm like this, like trying not to go. Because, yeah, eternal life is to know the Father. But knowing the Father is about knowing the Bible. So it's still about information. Are you following me? So this is where I am. And um, over several decades of time, there's this, this slow process of incremental steps. And it happens through the Gospel of John. And uh, I read the shack in 2007. It articulates things I've been thinking for about seven or eight years. I call him up. Actually, I didn't call him up. I wrote him an email. I said, I'd love to talk to you about this because he's, he's local. He lives 20 minutes away. I don't know where he lives, but I know he lives in the area. And uh, I get a phone call 10 minutes later. said, sure, I'd love to get together with you. Let's have lunch. I said, okay, when? What are you doing in an hour? <laughs> Nothing. Having lunch with you. So we did. And uh, a few months later, he introduced me to Baxter. And I ate crawfish. And I've never been the same. My brain is fried. So that's a little bit about me. To tell you where I'm coming from, the perspective that I have. Um, I realize that when I use the phrase, I have baggage, most people think of that as like going to the airport with a couple suitcases. When I say I have baggage, there's about 50 Mack trucks behind me, okay? And that's just level one baggage. And we've got multiple levels, dozens of levels. That's, that's my baggage. Okay, And it's an untwisting that's taking place in me and will take place for a long time to come. In fact, I don't think it'll be finished by the time I die, whenever that is. So, at this point in my life, as I'm traveling in a different narrative, a different story, one where the universe is not scary, one where God is better than I ever imagined he could be. One where my thinking starts with God not as an individual, a la Aristotle, the unmoved mover guy. It starts with a communion of three persons who are absolutely head over heels in love with each other. And so everything, I mean everything, I think about God and life changes because the starting point for me changed and in the midst of that I've come to realize that for most of us that have any similarity to my history to the story and the narrative that I used to travel in for them the Old Testament is their thorn in the flesh it's the thing that if I could just get rid of that then this whole paradigm that's changed, it fits great. But the Old Testament, it just throws me into a tailspin. 
It's like there's two different gods. In fact, the Old Testament, you know, we got to be fair here. To start off right from the beginning, it, it has a bad rap. It's called the Old Testament. Well, who wants the Old Testament, right? When my kids want a car to go somewhere, they don't want the old car. They want the new car, right? Nobody wants the Old Testament. Like, if I were to tell you at the beginning, 10 minutes ago, that I was going to spend this morning talking about the Old Testament, well, if I were you, I would have gotten up and went out into the sunshine and smelled beef and try and get Bill to cut you off some pieces. <laughs> Who wants to talk about the Old Testament? But yet, in the Old Testament, lies for us problems that some of us don't want to face. Some of us have tried to face it and we don't have an answer. I have friends that have simply given up on it. They, they basically think, it's, I mean, I literally have one friend that said, I don't think the Old Testament's really part of the Bible. It's not inspired in any sense like the New Testament is. And even my friends who still read the Old Testament, who still think it's the Word of God, that it's an inspired text, an inspired document, it's less than the new. And that the way that the Old Testament should be read is in the light of the new. That you take the New Testament and you shine its light onto the old so that you can get a better idea of what, what's going on there. Well, that's true because the Incarnation changed everything. But it's also not true. Because if you read the New Testament, every single author bases what they say in the Old Testament. They all quote it extensively, folks. That's their Bible. It's how they recognized who Jesus was. So, like, you can't sit there and read Paul or the writer to Hebrews or John and go, well, what you're saying is so much better than the Old. They'd look at you and go, are you nuts? We're getting a lot of this from the Old. We're not getting everything from it, but we get a lot of it. We see the continuity. So, though the New Testament light should shine back on the Old, I'm going to suggest that the Old Testament light should also shine on the New. Now, this became really clear to me when I was a teacher, and I used to teach the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews, his entire letter is based on the Old Testament in the fullest sense of that word when I say base. I don't know if you ever looked at this, being a teacher, I did. But when you look at chapter 1 of Hebrews, it's, it's just flat out brilliant. It is just brilliant on a level that I'm not there yet. And so I, I love it. But here's what he does. Not only does he open what he's going to say with one of the most amazing sentences ever that you'll read in the New Testament. But then after that, he proves that Jesus, the man Jesus, has eternally been with God, is the exact representation of this God, because he is God. And he does this, now watch, listen to this, and you, can, you don't have to believe me, you go look it up. He does this by quoting the Old Testament. And that's it. He has no comment. He has no explanation. He has nothing. He simply strings a bunch of quotes from the Old Testament together and proves that the man Jesus is the eternal son that he's got. And he does it completely in the Old Testament. That's brilliant. That's the beginning of everything he wants to say. Is do you know who this Jesus is? And he does it from the Old Testament. So, here's another thing. Like, I used to think, well, the Old Testament has all this, it has nothing relevant to me. And then a friend of mine tapped me on the shoulder and said, Hey, John, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures, He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. It has nothing relevant to say to you? Come on. Come on. Don't. I, I understand there's a lot of stuff in there that's difficult. But there's two problems that we face. 
One is a problem or an issue of content. There's things that happen in the Old Testament where it makes God look like a monster. I'm going to suggest to you that part of the reason he looks like a monster is not because of the content. It's partially because of the way that it's said. That's the second part. There's the content. There's the things that it talks about. But then there's a way it says it. And the way it says it isn't in your 21st century kind of sensibility. And it sounds very primitive because it is. And that presents problems for us. And they're very real problems. I get that. Part of the problem, though, isn't even the way it says it or the content. The biggest problem, I think, with the Old Testament is the paradigm that you bring when you read it. And the paradigm that you bring when you read it already says that God's a monster. So when you read it, it reinforces it. But here's another one. And I can't quote this one as well. But it's in Isaiah. It's in chapter 40. And it says, it says this. Listen to this picture. I got to get there. Hold on. You who bring good tidings to Zion. Now, any, anybody know what that, where that, what that means? You who bring good tidings? Where's, what's that word in, in New Testament language? Gospel. You who bring the gospel to Zion, go up on a high mountain. You who bring the gospel to Jerusalem, lift up your voice with a shout. Lift it up. Don't be afraid. Say to the towns of Judah, here, behold his... Here is your God. The sovereign Lord comes with power and his arm rules for him. His reward is with him. His recompense accompanies him. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and he carries them close to his heart. Get that picture? Right here. Where does God have you? Even in the Old Testament. Right in the middle of his embrace. That's not a New Testament concept, folks. It's an Old Testament concept. So, before we're ready to just eject it because there's stuff in it that's really troublesome to us, and I, I know the flood, Sodom and Gomorrah, sons of Korah, I, I know. But before we eject it, recognize that a lot of what you read in the New is based in the old. And if that isn't enough, I think you need to read Jesus some more. Because he quotes it all over the place. He finds it to be meaningful, significant, even authoritative. Not more authoritative than him. But when they come to him, he goes, search, search the scriptures. Look at Moses. He speaks of me. So one of the things that, that comes to our attention is, well, what, what kind of Bible were they using? Because Paul and the writer of Hebrews and James and John, all these guys quote the Old Testament. What kind of Bible were they using? How many of you have seen the movie The Book of Eli? Okay, like nobody on this half of the room has seen it. You're all asleep. I'll talk to this half. <laughs> I only talk to the people that listen to me. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's my Philadelphia sarcasm. I apologize. Okay, if you haven't seen it, you don't need to. But it's a really good movie. But it's pretty violent. It's about an apocalyptic world, and Denzel Washington's the lead character. He's Eli. And I'm not going to give anything away. No spoiler alert here. But at the end of the movie... Um, they take a Bible and they put it on a shelf. And I know nobody's going to know this, but I saw it as soon as they, as soon as they did it. They put the Bible on the shelf and right next to it was the Tanakh. The Tanakh is the Hebrew Bible. That's what it's called, the Tanakh. Because the Hebrew Bible, as best we can tell, in its final form, 
And it went through lots of forms. And there's lots of debate as to how it should be read. And that debate is going on even in the Bible itself. Okay? But the Hebrew Bible was in three sections. The Torah, which is the book of Moses. It's a singular book with five parts. It's called the book of Moses. Everywhere it's called the book of Moses. Then it's the Nebaim, which is the prophets. That's split into two sections, the former prophets, the latter prophets. And then there's the writings, which in the Hebrew Bible, the writings begin with Psalms and they end with Chronicles. So the last book of the Hebrew Bible is the book of Chronicles. Anybody? Everybody knew that, right? Or are you going, wait a minute, my Old Testament doesn't end with Chronicles? Well, the Hebrew Bible does. And it's significant why it does. Now this final, at least at this point, the final shape of the Hebrew Bible, the Tanakh, in these three sections, is something that we have to take seriously. I mean, there's a study and research that should be done, well, do we have the right form, that, and that's all well and good, but there's also research and study that should be taking seriously the idea that, well, what we have, why do we have this final shape? And as best I can tell, this is the Bible that the New Testament writers use. This is the Bible that Jesus refers to. I get this primarily from Luke 24, where Jesus appears to the two men on the Emmaus Road in that conversation. And in that conversation, Luke tells us that beginning with Moses, Jesus opens up the law, the prophets, and the writings, or some translations say the poems or poetry, and he explains everything in them concerning himself. Basically, what Jesus is sa- what Luke just said is that Jesus opened up the Tanakh, these three sections, the law, the prophets, the writings, and explained everything in it was about him. I, like In moments in history, that's one of the ones I want to be the fly on the wall. I would love to have been there listening to what he was saying. I don't know if I would have gotten any of it, but I still would love to have been there. And I would like to be there now, because I think I'd get a little more, but we'll work on that one for a few million years. Okay. So the Hebrew Bible was put together. And, and this, again, I, I know this may be basic for some of you, and I don't, I don't want to oversimplify things, but I, I want to help us um, at least get somewhere with our questions about the Old Testament. Um, when you read the Psalms, what you have is a collection of 150 poems. You're aware that there were thousands of poems that were written and used in Hebrew worship. But you only have 150. Somebody selected those 150 and left out the rest. Not only did they select the 150, but they put them in an order. Psalm 1 is Psalm 1 because it's supposed to be Psalm 1, not Psalm 27. Psalm 27 is Psalm 27 because it's not supposed to be Psalm 1. It's supposed to be the 27th one. So they're actually placed in an order that has continuity to it. They follow one another. This is, you can see this really well in certain places. Other places it's harder to see. But Psalm 23, 22, 23, and 24, the order is evident. It's pretty obvious. Psalm 8 and 9, the order is obvious. Actually, 7, 8, and 9, the order is obvious. There's different places where it's more apparent to us. It's very apparent in the Hebrew Bible, in the Tanakh, if you read Hebrew. Most of us don't. I did for a while. I don't anymore. I forgot it all. But it's there. The same is true with the Bible itself. Not only was, were the Psalms collected, selected, and then arranged. Are you following me? They were collected, selected, and then arranged. So was the Hebrew Bible itself. Okay, So the book of Moses is probably book of Moses 3.0. Because it's gone through some changes. 
How do I know that? Well, when you read, when you read the end of the book, Moses is dead. Now, this would be if you believe that Moses is the author. You don't have to believe that Moses is the author. There's, there's discrepancy. There's debate about that. But let's just say he is. At the end of the book, he's dead. But the book doesn't end. So a friend of mine said, yeah, I, I picture Moses writing, and then it does this, and it falls off the page, right? Just this line, you know, like when you fell asleep when you were in class. Like right now when we're talking about the Old Testament on Saturday morning. So, but the last nine verses of Deuteronomy, somebody else came and put them in there. And they're crucial. Not, o- not only are they crucial to the book of Moses, but they're crucial to the whole Hebrew Bible. Let me explain what I mean. You see, one person used to liken the Old Testament, I think this is a great analogy. They used to think of it as this piece of glass that had been completely exploded and obliterated. And, all, and the prophetic vision used to be this hole. And it exploded. And all you have in the Old Testament are these pieces. And we're trying... The Old Testament writers and us as interpreters of the Old Testament are trying to put them together. I'd like to think of it more like a stained glass window. You know, there's pieces, and where, where the pieces come together, we call those scenes. So in literature, they're compositional scenes, right? Literature, composition. So the scenes in the Old Testament we call compositional scenes. And these compositional scenes happen at the end of the Torah, the beginning of the prophets, and at the end of the prophets and the beginning of the writings. Those are the scenes. So at the end of the Torah, this other person comes in and says, and he's referring to Deuteronomy 18, where Moses said that there was a prophet that was to come someday, like Moses. And most everyone, including the rabbinic guys say that Deuteronomy 18 is about the Messiah. Okay, The Messiah is going to be this prophet like Moses that will come. This is who Moses is referring to in, in Deuteronomy 18. Well, this other person, whoever ended the Pentateuch, whoever ended the Torah, writes, he never showed up. That prophet like Moses never showed up. And this is done probably hundreds and hundreds of years after Moses has left the scene. So he's had a chance, or she's had a chance, or the community's had a chance to see the different prophets that have come and go, Elijah, whoever, and none of them are this prophet. So the Pentateuch ends, now watch this, it ends with the hope for the prophet like Moses, who is the Messiah, to come. That's what its focus is, okay? And it tells us at the end that Joshua now assumes leadership from Moses, and Joshua is a man full of the Spirit like Moses is, was. But he's, he's, although he's a prophet, he's not referred to as a prophet anymore. He's now referred to as a wise man. Joshua is referred to in both Joshua and other places of the Old Testament as a wise man. Now, listen to how Joshua begins. The one who meditates in the Torah, the book of Moses, day and night, that man will be blessed in all that he does. That man will find success. In fact, literally there is that man will find wisdom. Now listen to the other compositional scene that begins the writings. The first book of the writings in the Hebrew Bible is the Psalms, the collection of Psalms. How Psalm 1 start? Blessed is the man who doesn't walk in the counsel of the ungodly, sit in the blah, blah, blah. But what does he do? He meditates in the Torah day and night, and he will be like the tree planted by the river. You get it? So you've got these two major sections of the Hebrew Bible that are saying, we're still waiting for the prophet, but while we wait, We're going to meditate. We're going to think and chew on this because this is what will bring wisdom to us. Somebody has arranged this this way. 
Okay? This isn't an accident. And what I'm going to suggest to you, and I don't have the time to develop, but I'm going to suggest to you that whoever arranged not only the Tanakh, the Old Testament, but who arranged other things as well. If it was Moses that wrote the book of Moses, and he arranged it, there is intentionality, there is structure, and that intentionality and structure is primarily theological. And the theological burden is the Messiah. That's what they all want to talk about, is the Messiah. So when you read Luke and Jesus says he opens the Tanakh up, and he begins to explain to them all the things concerning himself. He's reading it a certain way. So, that doesn't, that doesn't help us necessarily with some specific questions about the Old Testament. But there's, there's things about the Old Testament that we shouldn't be surprised. For example, the Old Testament tells us that when Messiah comes, he will be God. The Creator God. The God who in the beginning creates the heavens and the earth. This is who will take on flesh. This is clear in Isaiah 7 when you read, The virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Now who picks that up? Matthew. In Matthew 1. He says, all of this took place referring to the genealogy of, of Jesus who he just traced back to being the son of David, okay? And the story of Joseph, Joseph and Mary having this child. He says, all of this took place to fulfill the prophet, the word of the prophet, saying, they shall call him Emmanuel. Now, what's really crazy about this is that right before he says that, he tells the story of the angel telling Joseph what to name the child. And he says, you should name the child what? Jesus. Right. Why? Because he'll save his people from their sins. That's what he says. And then Matthew says, <laughs> all of this took place to fulfill the word of the prophet. They shall name him, and you're expecting Jesus. But he doesn't say that. He says Emmanuel. Who is Jesus? Matthew goes, he's God with us. Now, I don't know if this one's going to help you, but for me... It, kind of is fun. The end of Chronicles, remember, I said Hebrew Bible ends with Chronicles. The last word of Chronicles is a verb. In grammar, we call it an ellipsis. It's a sentence without a subject. You have to provide the subject. And what it actually is, and you can look at this in your English Bibles, because conveniently in our English Bibles, they place Ezra and Chronicles right next to each other. Chronicles ends with an edict of Cyrus, and Ezra begins with the edict of Cyrus. But if you look at the two edicts, you'll notice that the one in Chronicles is about half as long as the one in Ezra. Because the, whoever's writing Chronicles starts to quote the edict, and he stops in the middle of the sentence and doesn't finish the sentence because he wants to do something. He ends his book with this verb, go up. So you supply him, let him, because it's in the passive. And I, that doesn't mean anything to anybody, but it, it is. Let him go up. Now the person that's in the context is this son of David who's going to come and rebuild the temple and bring intimacy of relationship back to the people with God. That's how the Old Testament ends. The New Testament begins with saying, Jesus is God with us. Who's bringing, the son of David, who's bringing intimacy back for us with God. Because back in the beginning of the Old Testament, I think one of the major things about this whole idea of the image of God, where in Genesis 1.26 it says, let us make man in our image. That whole concept, I think, at the very least, because I think it means just a boatload of stuff, but at the very least it means that there's the potentiality for relationship between man and God. Because he made us in his image so that we could have relationship. Again, now John will flesh this out in John 17, particularly when he records Jesus' prayer, that this relationship 
what he really has in mind, he's had this in mind since the beginning, is ultimately not just relationship with God, like something different from God's relationship. It's actual inclusion into the very relationship that God is. Now, the Old Testament didn't see that yet. But it saw the potentiality for, la- for relationship in telling us that we were made in His image. At the very least. It means far more than that. But I'm saying that's at least a starting point. So the Old Testament ends with, let him... Oh, I, and I forgot to tell you the best part. I'm sorry. He, the, this edict of Cyrus says, let him whose God is with him, let him go up. God with us. New Testament begins with, Jesus is God with us. Accident? No, I'm, I'm saying it's not an accident. I'm saying there's a theological heartbeat behind the way the Old Testament has been put together. And it's about the Messiah. And this is hundreds of years before Jesus ever shows up on the scene. Two last things, briefly. Yep, really briefly. Is the Old Testament... The best, I think, the one, one th- and I'm, I'm trying to give you big ideas here to help you to actually open it back up again someday and go and say, I think I might try and read this again. A friend of mine put this on Facebook not too long ago, it was a, it, and he was quoting someone else, and I can't remember who, they, who he was quoting, but the quote basically says this. I had to break up with my Bible in order to have a relationship with Jesus. And I get that. I do. I get that. I was a Bible teacher. I still am. But I was a Bible teacher for years. And when I started to really enter into and engage God as Trinity, as a communion of persons who are in love with each other and who have done everything out of that relationship, including make you and me, I had to put my Bible down. And I didn't read it for a long time. Because every time I'd even think about it, the old story would come just like a flood back into my mind and kind of just suppress and stuff my heart back down into this black hole of, no, that can't be right. Remember, the scripture says this. So I had to put it down. So there was a day when I opened up the Old Testament, because when I first picked up my Bible again, I didn't go to the Old Testament. I went to John. (laughs) That's where I went, because that was what got me where I got to, and I went to John. But when I went to my Old Testament, I went, because there was nothing but dust there. And I want to encourage you that there's God still speaks there. And I'm not saying return to an old covenant, but it's the Old Testament that tells you about the new one. And when it tells you about the new one, this is so cool, you guys. i, I got to read this to you. Jeremiah 31. Just listen to these words. This is a passage that the writer of Hebrew quotes in full. And I'm just going to read part of it. But he says, At that time I will put my law in their minds, I will write it on their hearts, I will be their God, and they will be my people. Now here comes the really cool part that no evangelical ever quotes. No longer will a man teach his neighbor or a man his brother saying, Know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. How many will know me? All of us. That's the promise of the new covenant. Let's, I don't know what that means. Let's take a while and try and figure that one out. But it's not unlike, in fact, it's very much in continuity with the promise that God made to Abraham. If you remember the promise that God made to Abraham was very simple. In you I will bless who? All the nations. Everybody. Your seed will be how I do that. And that seed will be as numerous as the sands of the seashore. If I had the time, I could also show you that that seed is a king who will come in the last days, who is of the seed of Abraham, who will deliver his people. 
And that's all found in the book of Moses. That's not New Testament stuff. That's all found in the book of Moses. The compositional scenes of the book of Moses are poems. It's like a Hollywood musical. You know, the story's going along, and all of a sudden the guy comes riding out on a horse singing a song with a guitar. And you go, it's time to get popcorn. That's the poem in the Pentateuch. The story stops, and you read the poem, but the poem interprets all the stuff you just read. And the poems are all about this king that will come in the last days. There's so many things in there. There's so much that's to be said. My point this morning was to try and encourage you to say there's good stuff there. Don't eject it. Don't throw it out yet. I'm not saying you can't because it's not about information. It's not about what you know. It's about who you know. But I believe we can come to know Him Jesus, the eternal Son, who's in communion with His Father and the Spirit, we can come to know Him, which is eternal life, through the old and the new. Okay? All right, thank you.